and now we will uh, yeah, dive, dive a bit more uh, deeply into um, yeah, preparations for the new privacy shield. It has been um, announced and um, with regard to uh, privacy and also data sovereignty in the cloud setting, um, the, the privacy shield and all EU US transfers basically. Um, are absolutely essential. Before I give the stage to our amazing speakers, just one uh, note: due to the technical difficulties we uh, experienced earlier, we need to shuffle. Uh, yeah, we needed to shuffle around uh, the sessions a bit in our uh, program. So um, I'll be uh, I'll be a bit I, I'll be here a bit longer on the main stage because we'll be introducing my colleague Fl Florian Bayer um, for the digital marketing and privacy um, session later here today. So from four fifteen. 15 to 4.45. We'll include a German, uh, yeah, German session regarding digital marketing and privacy here, so stay tuned. If you missed the session on the German stage, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, do that here later, that just in advance so you know what is happening. All the other program changes we'll put in the chat on, on the platform, so you will hopefully be able to rewatch or rejoin uh, everything you wanted to see in the first place place. All right, and now uh, back to the workshop. Um, I, I'm very happy to have Matthew Bertzinski here with me. He's a Senior Product Management Director uh, at Fortrock and Ruth Glasmeier. She's an ex account executive also at Fortrock. And as I uh, yeah, teased uh, the, the title already, it is uh, preparing for the new privacy shield with privacy and data sovereignty in the cloud. Um, yeah, yeah, I can see you both. So Matthew, Ruth, thank you for, for being here. I'll uh, give, give the stage over to you for, for the workshop. I think you'll be happy to take uh, questions uh, either later or during the session. But for now, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having us here at your privacy workshop today. This is really an important topic that, that we want to discuss and we prepared some information for you. Uh, one of the things I do want to do is encourage people, if you can, to use the chat message to enter your comments or to have feedback to interact with our session. Uh, as, as introduced, I'm Matthew Brzezinski. I'm a Senior Director of Product Management here at Fordrack. I've been in identity management and dealing with privacy and regulations for you know over 20 some years now. Um, and I've seen a lot of things, and, and I can tell you that, that TREMS 2 and, and the Transatlantic Digital Privacy Act has really uh, been one of the bigger things that I've seen happen when it comes to views on what happens with, with digital privacy. Uh, joining me today is Ruth Glashmir. She's an account executive in, in Germany. She's had a lot of extensive experience with our customers and how they're handling some of these privacy concerns and walking them through these things. And also we have Nicola Para who is here, you know, she's our, our senior field marketing manager and she has seen how this has been impacting what people have been interested in as well. And she'll be helping with the presentation as well. So with that, uh, if we can go on to the next slide, uh, I think if anybody joined Adam's <clears throat> presentation earlier today, uh, we're going to use a thing called Slido in, in our presentation. It's a way to poll the audience uh, to get your guys' feedback real time to show up on the screen. Uh, so if everybody could just take take time to go to slido.com, and when you get there, enter the number you see on the screen, 11449699. And then um, once I give you guys a, a couple minutes to do that, we just want to start, uh, we'll ask you our, our first question, and and really just to prepare you guys for that, It's it's really, you know, uh, is is the transatlantic privacy framework important to your organization? And you know, what have you guys done? Uh, is there anything you guys have done in that regard? So um, let's go start looking at the results. Let's see how many how many people we have uh, out there. Um, as you can see right now, we got we got uh, a lot of people saying yes. A few people saying I'm not sure. Uh, no one's saying no, which uh, I guess is to be expected at a at a privacy conference. Uh, I think if I was at a marketing conference, there would probably be a bunch of people that say no. Uh, but given the audience here, um, yeah, we can see that there is a overwhelming majority of people that think that the transatlantic privacy framework is important to your organization. And then the other 6% of you out there that are unsure, um, you know, may, maybe 
maybe you'll you'll be in that that yes camp by by the end of this presentation. Um, we've only had seventeen respondents. Maybe I should give this uh, another few seconds here, see if anybody else uh, responds. But I think right now uh, we we kind of got uh, a sense and a feel for uh, what what's going on out there. So um, with that. Uh, let's just go on to the next slide. And, you know, one of the things that that's important is, um, you know, it's not just about data privacy and keep, you know, keeping people, keeping people's data safe. Uh, Cause obviously, you know, there's regulators out there and things along those lines. But the other thing is, is that it really drives, you know, your customer retention and it, and it drives your loyalty to your brand. So when you stop and think about privacy, you know, you have to think about it from a few different areas and a few different perspectives and lenses, right? So the first thing is that you have to understand for consumers out there and everybody deals with consumer, even your employees these days want to be treated with the same kind of easy consumer experience. Um, the first thing is, you know, consumers really want to have this, this very transparent view of how their data is being used, and they want to be able to manage that. And not only that, right, what, what they also want to do is consumers flock to companies uh, that offer the, the most friction-free online experiences. Um, so, you know, they want to have everything be as easy as possible. They, they want to be prompted you know, as little as possible for authentication, or if they are prompted, they don't even want to see it. Uh, so they want to have these really great experiences, yet they demand absolute security, right? They demand that you take care of their data in an absolute secure manner and that you're, and that they can trust you uh, with, with, um, with their data. So, you know, the easiest way to lose a customer is to suffer a security breach. So as soon as that happens, you know, customers start start to flee. Um, and this isn't because their data was immediately affected, but because their perception of the brand is diminished, right? So if they all of a sudden feel like, oh my gosh, their data isn't important, isn't safe anymore, um, they're going to start looking looking for alternatives. And then from a provider perspective, so you know, the organizations that are offering services. You know, what, what is it that, that you have to do there? Well, privacy is really about compliance, right? So, I mean, from, from your guys' point of view, you want to make sure you're not going to get sued. You want to make sure that, you know, no one's going to get access to the data and, and put it out there. You don't want to get fined. And then on the backside of that, it's, it's about retention. Because once again, if you go back to what I said, if you don't have a breach, customers are more willing to stay with you. If you have a breach, they're going to leave. So you really have to make sure that people's data is secure and that they feel that your brand is secure. And then lastly, it, it's regulators, right? So what do the regulators do? So the, the regulators are looking at areas where they know there are a lot of issues. So um, regulators see privacy as an opportunity to intervene in into some imperfect markets, right? So they have to make sure that people, that organizations are taking the right controls and taking the right process and putting the right processes in place to protect the people's data they're storing, whether that's their customers, their employees, or anything along those lines. They really feel they have to step in and protect that, that risk of abuse. So if you think about what are some of the highly regulated industries when it comes to consumers, it's anybody that has financial data on a customer. So a bank has a lot of things they have to do because obviously they hold somebody's financial information. But if you store credit card information, things along those lines, you find yourself in a different regulatory uh, level. So these guys are advocating for the privacy and the protection of the data. So you couple all these together and the notion of trust and developing that across this entire ecosystem uh, becomes really important. And so with that, I've talked a lot right about now, and you know, I do have Ruth on the phone. So Ruth, I wanna pass it over to you a little bit and your experience uh, out, out there talking to customers. Are you seeing uh, companies who are making buying decisions based on how their systems give their customers uh, control and this level of, of uh, goodwill uh, over their data privacy? Yes, thank you, Matt. Um, yes, I've seen it a lot on the market, um, especially, of course, we touched about the point about financial industries. It's a very important point there. 
but it's also starting to come up with other organizations. Um, one customer I've recently worked with was actually in retail and they came to us initially to solve their consumer trust issue. Um, they had the big issue that there was no single view of the customer and for their service team, it was way easier to just make a new profile than go online and double check that the customer that's in the store right now doesn't already have a profile online. And that led to a lot of customer frustrations, not just because um, they didn't see all their purchases on their portal. So it wasn't just a marketing thing, which the, cost, uh, the organization was thinking of first, but there was a way bigger underlying issue because people could not opt out out of all profiles because they didn't know how many profiles they had in the end. Um, they, with that, they didn't know what data was shared with whom and when and of course, if that all led to the point that I said, I don't want to be a customer with them. Um, it's really brought up the fact that this was not GDPR compliant and made it very difficult to actually access their right to be forgotten. And because of that, the, this organization lost the trust of the customers and therefore the customers moved elsewhere, at least for their online shopping. And that was a very big issue for them. So they started a project to firstly focus on the marketing side of things, but then quickly realized that it was not just a marketing issue, it was a privacy issue. And it was a trust issue with these organizations and with the customers. Um, so they decided that they would put a good functioning customer identity and access management at the heart of things. And that's just one example of a customer case. I mean, most of my customers that I work with and prospects understand that at the heart of things, trust is just a combination on privacy and easy to handle data. And trust can best be achieved if you're transparent about the data, what data is being shared with whom, and at the same time, giving the customers the option to really easily access and change their data. And that's also something where, for example, our user managed access can play a big role, but to go into depth with that one would really take way too long into the in this context. So if you want more info on that, go on our company profile or message me directly and we can discuss later on. But I would really like now for you guys to maybe go into the chat and just write down um, maybe some experience of yourselves in the organizations that you work with, and if that's something that resonates with you, I would really appreciate your feedback on that. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Ruth. And, and while hopefully people have some some chats and some messages for us, you know, it's really interesting how how you pointed out there that you know organizations were that this organization was just creating multiple profiles for people and and all the problems that that uh, brought about right so i mean not only was it a bad customer experience hey you know you can't imagine if you couldn't go onto amazon and see everything you bought well i mean that would just be be that you couldn't even imagine that i, I couldn't imagine that so i mean think about just that experience but then you you get to like the real the real meat of the issue there right so how do I how do I control my data? Because I know this this profile, I have no way to get to the last profile. I don't know where it sits, and I know I have data sitting in it, and I'm still getting marketing messages. And then where else is that data going? So my my personal data is just flying around the internet. And then of course you know, and so that's the consumer side, the provider side. They don't even have a single place to go look and see what their customer bought. So you know, think about. So how are you going to market to that customer, right? How are you going to say, oh, you bought these three things. You're going to want these two things. So on the consumer side, hey, I don't know what's happening with my data. From the provider side, they don't even know who their customers are and, and how active they are. And then, of course, you mentioned on the regulatory side, the right to be forgotten. So, you know, so you can see how privacy cuts across all three of these these tiers here on the consumer provider and and regulatory side and, and it's and as you mentioned it, it all comes down to having a good centralized system in place an identity management system to be that focal point 
of of your privacy concerns. Um, I'm not seeing anything in in the chat right now, so that's okay. Uh, we'll move on uh, to the to the next slide. And and the thing I want to talk about here is is data sovereignty. Um, you know, a lot of people. I think data sovereignty is has become a huge buzzword in the industry, and everybody talks about data sovereignty as if they know what it is. And and I think there are sometimes, and I, I have to admit, you know, I, I think probably eight months ago, I I fell in this camp. I thought I knew what data sovereignty was, and since everybody else did, I didn't really ask. Um, but you know, so for the purposes of this workshop and for the rest of this conversation. I just kind of want to define uh, what data sovereignty is because it goes well beyond uh, just data residency, right? So, you know, at the core, it is knowing where does your data sit, right? So what is, but, you know, so that's great. Um, that's, that's a big part of it, but it, it's broader than that. It's making sure that your data is being um, handled um, it's subject to the laws and the regu regulations as to where it was captured or collected. So you can have data sit in a different country as long as it's being handled by the regulations and the laws it was captured. So some countries say you can't translate, transport that data out of the country. Here we're talking about TREMS2 and the Transatlantic Privacy Protection. So that means, hey, anything that gets sent out of out of Europe over to over to America is subject to, you know, maybe America ask, asking for information on it. So now you're starting to get outside of the laws and the regulations of where it's captured. So, you know, it's it so it goes and so some of those laws, some of those regulations talk about data encryption. How is your data encrypted? How is it encrypted at rest? How is it encrypted when it's being transported? How is it backed up? How often is it backed up? Where does the backup stay? So there's a lot of things that you have to think about when it comes to data data sovereignty. And that's okay. I mean, they're complicated. The other thing that's driving the complication here is organizations moving to the cloud. So, you know, as organizations are trying to move to the cloud, uh, they start losing absolute control over where the data sits. And as you're consuming SaaS services, you lose control over how is the data encrypted? Where is it processed? How is it backed up? All these different things. And so, you know, I mean, let's, let's face it. It becomes very, very complicated because if you have a shared service, they, they might be sending processes and, and data and things to resources that have that have less of a load on them. So all of a sudden, the resource that's closest to you has a has a heavy peak load, and then you get sent to a, a processing center that's outside of your region, and then without even knowing it, your organization's broken data sovereignty. And if anybody saw Adam's Adam's uh, presentation earlier today. What you'll probably see and, and what, what he talked about was where Shrems, Shrems 2 kind of originated from. And it was, you know, it was from Facebook who, you know, was born in the cloud. And, um, and, and we can all have our discussion as to how, how much people trust Facebook with their personal data. I mean, everybody gave it to them, not even realizing what was going on. And I think a lot of people uh, kind, of, kind of think about that now, but it all started with them transferring a load over to uh, the US to process that data. And so they shoved it, they transferred the data over there, they ran it on processors over there. And so that broke the laws of how you collect data in Ireland. And so that's what that's what brought all this, this about. So, you know, it gets really tricky. Going back, you know, it's just that's that's how it how it works. So there are ways to go to the cloud. I know there's been a lot of, there's probably been a lot of talk in, in this conference and I've, I've seen some of it already about how Shrems works and how the cloud, you know, and what that means for, for moving to the cloud. And we'll talk a little bit about more about that later, um, but just here's data sovereignty and um, here's how it makes it hard to move to the cloud. So moving on to the next slide and guys, uh, just so you know, um, if you have any comments, please put, put them in the, in the chat. Uh, we're, we're really hoping this would be an interactive uh, workshop, but um, due to some of the technical issues, it, it isn't able to be that. So please, you know, provide your chat. I can talk all day, uh, but I'm sure you guys will get bored of my voice. Um, so, but why is digital identity and digital identity privacy important? Why 
why is it important? So um, once again, if we go to the next slide, I'm going to talk about um, a, a little situation here. And, you know, this is a, a solution and, and a concept that that I've worked with my, my colleagues on to kind of talk about. And it's really the evolution of trust on the internet. Um, and so if you think about it, um, I, I call this the trust sandwich. Uh, other people call this other things. And, and you know, the digital identity and trust, it kind of revolves around everything. But when we think about the evolution of trust on the internet, and we go back you know, to when the internet first started, and they first, an organization first started offering services online. It was all about the organization had to figure out who was on the other end of the internet, right? Who was the person sitting in front of the computer? And I'm not even going to talk about phones at this point in time because phones weren't connected to the internet. I mean, we're talking way back then when it, it was a privilege to have the ability to be online and interact uh, in a digital environment. And so, you know, there was a very famous uh, cartoon that came out in the New Yorker that said, you know, no one knows you're a dog on the internet. And so basically what that says is you could be anybody on the internet. So if organizations wanted to do commercial business with people, they had to find a way to build trust. And that was the person that they, that they were actually dealing with. And to do that, they asked people to do multiple things to establish that trust. And people did. Um, because if people wanted to utilize the internet to do business, to not have to go out of their house, to have things show up at their door, or to be able to pay their phone bill, or to be able to use online banking, they gave up all this information because it, it was what they had to do. And so trust was very much a, a one-way uh, situation here. It was really, I, as a, as a company, have to trust you as the consumer that you are the person you are. And this worked for a while and people were happy with it. Um, and, and, you know, the, the concept of zero trust kind of came into this where, hey, I only really trust you after you authenticate. So I make you authenticate a lot of times and that way, you know, I'm being safe. And then the person who has that data, they feel, hey, no one's going to steal my credentials. However, as things have changed, as people have started to realize, you know, how important and how valuable their personal information is, and, and you know, and to think about the value of personal information, it's not hard to comprehend that when you look at the stock price of Google or you look at the stock price of, of Facebook, people saw that and they said, oh my gosh, these are people that have my personal data and they're making this much money off of it. So people, A, realize the value of it. And the second part is, is now that you can get to the internet via your phone and everybody, you know, not everybody, but a high percentage of, of world citizens, especially in the Western world in Europe, have access to the internet, it's assumed that you have access. It's no longer a privilege. So before, if you lost your online identity, yeah, it could be bad, but it wasn't, you know, there was only so many places you could go and use that online identity. Now, if you lose your online identity, you've really lost, it's, it's like full on identity theft because somebody can go be you everywhere. So now, people not only realize the value of, of, of their digital identity and their personal information, but they also realize how important it is and how much it is part of themselves as, as well. So if you lose your digital identity, it, you're, you're kind of hampered. So now this trust has to go the other way. So now it's not just a corporation has to trust that it's you, the right person accessing the account. So, I mean, that's still true. I have to make sure when somebody logs on to a, you know, creates an online banking account that that is the right person. However, that person creating that online banking account now has to trust the entity that they're the bank that they're working with, that they will be a good steward of their data, that they will make sure that no one's going to get access to it via a breach, that they're only going to share it with the people that they that the that the customer wants to allow them to share it with. Right. So now an organization has to build that level of trust with the consumer so that the consumer feels that they can trust them with their information. So if you really think about the evolution of trust, it went from being very one way to being a complete circle. And, you know, one of the things that I saw with, with an organization, and, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ruth because I've been talking way too much, but one of the things that I saw an organization experiment with 
is as they're doing registrations, they have different social identity providers that are available for their customers to use to sign on. And what they were doing during their beta rollout was doing tests as to which social providers being on there lower the perception of trust for that company. So what combinations gave the, the company the highest in roles and made people feel they could trust the company the most. So that's the level that, that we're getting at with that, that uh, 360 degree view here of trust. So with that, Ruth, um, I know I, I just, I've been speaking for, for a lot here, um, but hey, I wanna ask you, you know, so what do you hear happens when an end user suffers a lack of control of their data? I mean, what are companies doing in response to that? What are consumers doing in response to that? And, and guys out there, while Ruth's talking, if you wanna chime in on the chat, please, please do let us know your experiences. Let us know what you're seeing. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, please share your experiences as well. Um, Obviously, I can talk a lot about what my customers are doing, but in the end, I'm a consumer myself. Um, so I would like to talk about an example of where I lost trust into a company just because how my data was handled. So basically, if we're looking at my normal Christmas, um, which is coming up soon again, I tend to make photo calendars for my family or for my closest relatives. And as ever, basically every year, I went last Christmas online on the same website I always do it at to prepare and order these calendars. However, since last year, 2021, I had moved or so the year before 2020 and changed my address. So I went to order, I changed my address online and I thought that's it. And I would get the calendars relatively quickly. Somehow. That changed the process and the calendars were routed to my old address in another town. Please keep in mind, this was two weeks before Christmas. I know I was a bit late on that, but still. So I called that company and I said, hey, is there anything that we can do? So they said, yes, yeah, sure. Um, we are going to change your address. We're going to reprint these calendars, send it to you. Next day, I went online, checked my emails and my calendars were shipped. But guess where? Not to my new address, again, to the old address. And so I called a third time and finally managed to somehow change my address, get the calendar shipped um, to my actual address. And the person that was renting my apartment previously was kind enough to send these calendars to my new address as well. So instead of three, I suddenly had nine calendars. That made my family quite happy, but I started to really doubt that company where I tend to order these calendars from. Because if something as small as changing my address to a new address is already such a big issue, how do I know how they're handling my data? Because, you know, there's a big question mark behind it. They're not transparent about something as simple as changing the address. So I therefore, went online, decided to take my right to be forgotten. Um, I tried to log into the website, delete my profile, but unsurprisingly enough, it was very difficult. <laughs> In the end, I still managed and I found another place where I could this year order my Christmas calendars from. Um, but I obviously had another issue, which was now nine people were expecting calendars because they started getting used to that. Um, so this is what I see with my customers and organizations that I'm working with as well, that these tiny little things of not being transparent, of not being able to easily change your address and your data can go a long way because customers will lose trust in organizations. And privacy is definitely not just about being compliant to GDPR and other things but it's about the trust and the customer retention behind it. It has a very larger impact than we tend to just talk about. And I don't see anything in the chat, but I would be very happy if you can maybe share similar experiences or maybe share your view on what privacy actually means to your organization, just further than just compliance. Yeah, Ruth, uh, thanks for that. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's really important that uh, one of the things that you pointed out there um, 
is that yeah so they couldn't change your address and that that got frustrating and obviously another impact there was it's your frustration and it's getting closer and closer to christmas and you don't have anything to give people and you know why do we shop online? We shop online with organizations that we trust are going to get us what we want. But then, you know, they couldn't, they didn't handle your data correctly all along the line. And then the the last straw, Ruth, is you go in and you say, hey, I want to be forgotten. And how long did that take you? I mean, what was it easy? It wasn't easy. Um, I went online. I tried to find it on their website. I tried to go under my profile. Didn't work. Um, there was no real button or anything that could easily make me delete my profile and the right to be forgotten. Um, so I basically, again, for the fourth time that year, gave a call to their call center and said, look, thank you for the nine calendars without extra costs, but I don't think you're handling my data well, um, so I would like to be forgotten. So it was another phone call and more time spent on the hotline with those Still very friendly people. Yeah, and, and you know what? I'm sure, I'm sure somewhere along the way that that falls under GDPR compliance where they have a way to get you the right to be forgotten. But, you know, maybe, maybe if they made it easy and you could go in and say, yeah, I just want to be forgotten and you can manage your data and don't be sending data here and don't do this. You might have said, okay, so they had, it was Christmas time. They couldn't handle my, my parcel. They couldn't figure out how to change my address. At least they didn't send it to, to some random address someplace else. Maybe I'll give them another chance because here I can manage everything. But then when they make that hard and they make that obfuscated, then it's what are they trying to hide, right? They're not being transparent. They're not giving you uh, the opportunity to do what it is you want to do with your data as a consumer. And so um, if we move on to the next slide, you, you know, one of the things that, that is really important here is that what we're really getting to is digital identity underpins all your online transactions. And that's why it's so important to have uh, a really modern SIAM uh, solution in, in front of what you're doing. Because, you know, in, in Ruth, in your example, if you call in or, or you go online, and you update your address and your shipping address one place, that should not only be in your profile, it should also be in your billing profile, it should be in your shipping profile, it should just, per, uh, uh, it should just move to all the different applications that organization has that is fulfilling that consumer experience. But it didn't, right? And so in your situation, it got very disjointed and that made you believe well, how do I know they can actually manage my data? Because if I, if I change it one place, it's obviously not getting changed someplace else. And so if you go, hey, I need to be forgotten, how, how do you still to this day know that you're not in one of their databases? Because obviously they don't have them all, all pinned together, right? Um, so just think about your digital identity, right? And think about the, the journey on that identity. So from the time you enroll, self-service enrollment, you show up to a website, you say, hey, I wanna buy calendars from you guys. Do you wanna create an account? Yeah, I do, because I wanna be able to come back and do this again. So that's that's where we, we start with your digital identity. That's where we create your digital identity. Every time you come back and you authenticate, we're gonna hit your digital identity again. You wanna update your information, your preferences, all those different things. That's all under self-service and that, that's in your digital identity. And then when we look at corporations and what are they doing, they wanna personalize their, your experience. So they wanna tag things to your digital identity, what you bought, where you live, what you like, different things along those lines. And then finally, it all comes down to privacy. And that's, does a consumer, Ruth, you have the ability to say, this is what you have on me and this is what I allow you to share. And, and is that very easy and transparent? And for the organization, are you protecting that identity? Are you protecting that information and making sure that it's not easily accessible to nefarious actions? So it's really, you know, I, I mean, I think that it's another, another one of those. And this one, you know, there is a circle on the screen. It's very circular, right? Because the more you can show you protect people's identity and the more confidence your customers have in your ability to, to utilize, to, to secure the service, the more they're going to tell people, hey, you know, why don't you use the service? They, they deliver great stuff to me. I trust them, all this stuff. So it's really going to not only help retention, 
I mean, definitely going to help retention, but it's also going to help you grow uh, by word of mouth as well. So um, once again, let's get to some more fun times here. So I think we have two more Slido questions coming up next. Um, so do you know in your organization where you are storing personal data? So if we can go back to Slido, slido.com and 11449699. Uh, do you know where is your personal data stored? So I think um, I think what you see here is that you know, guys, good to see that that you're still there. You haven't fallen asleep as as we've been talking, Ruth. Um, but you know, um, I, I know where where four drug stores our data, and I know where where our four drug customers store store their data, and. You know, it's um, it, it's well, it, it's a combination of, of of all of these. So there would be a mixture of both. There would be some of our customers that are just on prem, and some of our customers that are that are strictly in the cloud. Um, Ruth, what what are you seeing out there in in your region? Are you seeing organizations move to the cloud? Or are they are they still in hybrid? Where where what are you seeing while we let these people uh, respond? I'm seeing a quite differentiated picture. Um, right now, there are still a lot of organizations that use us on premise. Um, a lot of them are moving to the cloud. They're slowly but steadily a big move to customers being interested in SaaS solutions because there's obviously a lot of, you know, positivity behind that. Um, and yeah, it's just changing. Constantly, yeah. um, it's it's getting stronger. Cloud is getting stronger and stronger, and it's more and more a requirement when I'm talking to customers. Yeah, a absolutely. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the reasons that I got into identity management and, and technology in general, oh, 20 some way more than 20 years ago now, uh, is because it's constantly moving. And, you know, it's constantly moving. Technology is moving. You know, all of a sudden the cloud's out there, you know. You know, you think about it, one of the biggest cloud providers now, Oracle, Larry Ellison, when the cloud first came out, was was a non-believer. Now, you know, if it's not cloud, it, it's not a, not a conversation. So you have technology advancing. You have, and then to keep up with that technology, you have regulations out there. And then you have consumer behavior and their expectations. So... So there's a lot of things going on there. So let's go look at the, the next slide. Uh, one more question here before we we move on. So if your data is stored in the cloud, which is only a few of you based on the last, where where is it stored? Um, where, where are you guys storing storing your data? Um, is it you know in in your own country in the cloud? Is it is it uh, is it in the European Union? Is it outside the European Union? Or are you just not sure? And, you know, I would think, Ruth, uh, as I'm looking at some of these, you know, a lot of these are, you know, probably, you know, um, private clouds. So, hey, you know, I go to AWS, I kind of know where my, my data is. Um, but, you know, I mean, a lot of these private cloud companies move things around as well. Do, do you see that? I mean, are you seeing people leverage SaaS or are they leveraging private clouds for, for compute power? It really depends on the organization, to be fair. I mean, especially um, highly regulated organizations are still looking at private clouds, whereas others, especially in retail, I see more and more people moving to SaaS solutions because of all the benefits that brings with it, because you obviously don't have all the configuration stuff behind it. You can just relax and wait for others to update for you. Um, but on the other hand, I still also still see a lot of people being on prem. So I think it's a it's a good representation as I'm seeing here on the screen, to be fair, because I think it's a one third, one third, one third kind of situation that I'm looking at. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, I, I see, you know, the European country where business is incorporated, and I see the European country where data is collected and you know, one of the things I would love if anybody would like to comment in the comments, uh, if you guys even have access to the comments, is um, where is that data backed up? 
So if it's if it's collected and it's stored in the area where it's collected and you're collecting it in multiple European countries, is it backed up in each of those countries or is it backed up in one place and vice versa with where it's incorporated? Is all that data uh, backed up where it's incorporated? So Ruth, I know we're, we're getting close to time here and we got another topic. Um, why don't we move on to the to the next slide here? Because one of the things that you know I'm looking at and I see uh, is the interpreting the new data privacy regulations, and it's really people trying to figure out, you know, how are you going to handle all the privacy regulations that that comes with Shrems too? And you know, I've seen and, and Ruth, you can probably tell me a little bit more about this as well. But I've talked to customers. Um, that are sitting there that are asking me, you know, I don't think I can store my data in a U.S. owned cloud, even though that data resides in that data center, it resides in the country or the European Union or the country I'm collecting the data in, and it, it meets all the data sovereignty regulations because it's a U.S. based cloud, there's this feeling fear, I, I don't know. And, and trust me, I'm from the US. Uh, I, I've lived here in Europe for, for three years now in the UK, but is there just, there's this overwhelming um, risk aversion to storing data in a US based cloud. What are you seeing on that, Ruth? Is, is, that, is that real? Um, I mean, is it perception? Is it the reality of, of the environment? What, what are you seeing? I see that a lot, um, especially every conversation I'm trying to start with a customer, maybe already an existing customer or a new prospect looking into Fortrock as a solution for them. Um, the first discussion I'm having is, yes, it's all nice and well, but it's hosted on Google. So it's an American owned cloud. We don't really want to do that. And we tend to usually find an argument around it, uh, especially when we start the discussion to go really into depth, see what their environments are, if they use other products that are already hosted in American owned clouds. And especially if we're looking at Fortrock, making it easy to have this tenant isolation and to make it easy to host, although it's in Google Cloud, in the region of your choice. That is usually an argument that at a certain point they will look up to and say, well, okay, let's do it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think, I think Ruth, um, I see a lot of, I have a lot of conversations with customers around our, our identity cloud being a, being a, the senior director of product management here. There's a lot of things and about our cloud. And, you know, one of the things that, that I try to talk to, to the customers here that have this issue is that, you know, not being able to use a U.S.-based cloud, which, you know, let's, let's be frank about it. A lot of cloud services, whether they're SaaS or whether they're just cloud storage, are U.S.-based and or they're running on the back end of AWS, GCP, Microsoft Azure. Some of your biggest SaaS providers out there are running off the back of, of, of these other companies. And what it does is it really hampers um, the rapid adoption of technology, right? And it puts organization in these countries in um, in a, a business agility um, or it, it really slows down their business agility, which, you know, takes away from some of their competitiveness uh, when it comes to providers from, from other areas. So it's really something people need to think about. Uh, I think, you know, I, I think it's been a lot of overreaction. I think we've seen recently there was a, an appeals court and Ruth, you can help me with this, but there was an appeals court that, that said we don't have to, to shy away from storing stuff in the U.S.? Is there something else you can talk about yeah, that? Yeah, sure. I think this topic has been discussed quite significantly also in the La Paz conversations today and yesterday. Um, but to just go into the conversation again with the court ruling in Karlsruhe, um, I mean, it really showed what the situation is on the market right now, where especially public organizations don't really want to work with American cloud vendors. And um, it's a topic that I see more and more. So when I talk to public organization, I tend to not even go in there with our cloud solution because I know I will be shut down within two seconds. Um, but I think this is something that has taken it quite far. Uh, even privacy advocates out there are saying, well, the ruling or the idea to just 
get rid of all American cloud vendors and the public organizations and public tenders is just taking it way too far. And it's only very small risk um, that data is shared where they sh it shouldn't be shared. And that risk is extremely tiny. And um, on top of that, it tends to forget the fact that even an organization, not everybody has access to customer and employee data. And I'm very happy to see that Karlsruhe actually agreed with that, because if the data is contractually hosted in Germany, then what is the <coughs> risk eventually? Yeah, absolutely. And and thank you, thank you, Ruth, for that. So uh, let's just go to the last slide. And Ruth, you know, you kind of talked about uh, the Fordrack isolated tenant environment. And so just, just to kind of give people the, the thing here and, and what, what we're driving at at Fordrack, because we believe in privacy and data sovereignty and things along those lines, is that if you look at the Fordrack solution, we have these isolated tenant environment, which is completely different from your typical multi-tenant architecture. And as I spoke about the legacy SaaS solution, out there, they're multi-tenant, they run in these pods, these pods are replicated and bounced across different data centers based on where they have the most compute power. Whereas with Fordrack, we have our isolated tenant environment, which means every customer has their own environment from their data storage to their compute to the, the runtime modules, everything is all theirs. And they get to choose the region that they have their data in. So it never leaves the data center that, that they choose. So if you choose Germany to, have, to host your data, it never leaves Germany. Amsterdam, same thing. Belgium, same thing. So what does that also provide you? That means you don't have any nosy neighbors, any noisy neighbors. So no one can get access to that tenant because it's completely isolated and on its own. So you have this complete data privacy situation here. And then the last thing that you want to talk about, we talked about was backups. We back up these environments every two hours and they're stored once again in that same region uh, where, where your information is. So please, there's a lot more about our Fordrack Identity Cloud. It's one of the fastest adopting identity clouds out there. Um, please come to our website, take a look at it. Um, you know, find out more about our tenant isolation. If you do want to find out more about anything, you want to, you know, send in any of your responses, any comments, please feel free to reach out to myself or Ruth. Uh, you can find us here at our, our at uh, Ruth Glasmere at Fordrock.com or Matthew Brzezinski at Fordrock.com. And we'd love to hear more and continue the conversation. But for now, thanks for the time, everybody. And I'll turn it back over to the stage and the, and the promoters there. How are you guys doing? Thank you uh, so much, Matthew and Ruth. I think you, you covered a lot of ground uh, today in, in your workshop. And uh, yeah, dear members of the audience, please absolutely feel free to reach out to Matthew and Ruth if you have any, any additional questions <coughs> or want to, want to get more information about how, um, yeah, how the system is, is working. Because uh, Matthew, Ruth, I have um, even previously of, of our uh, yeah, talks about the, your contribution to the privacy conference, I, I heard a lot about what you guys are doing and I think it absolutely deserves uh, more attention. So uh, thank you so much for presenting everything here today and um, yeah, hope to continue the talk soon.